<laughs> but uh, so the New York Times came out, and they you know they covered they covered the struggle in Wisconsin as they do struggles in, in any state in America. They treat you know the states of America tend to be treated by the elite media institutions of this country, be it New York Times, Washington Post, NBC, ABC, CBS. They treat us, they treat the states out in the country, and I think this is true of Arizona, and a little bit like they treat Africa, yeah. right? It's a, it's a whole bunch of them out there, and, and they're all a little bit different, I know that, and uh, a lot of different countries. Do we have to learn the capitals? Okay, you know, and, and sometimes they come and cover you. And so the New York Times saw these incredible pictures, and by the end of the first week in Madison, I think, you've got to understand this, so you have 50 people out that first day. A couple days later, 1,000, 8,000, 20,000, 40,000, 50,000. By the first Saturday, there's close to 100,000 people out on the square in Whoa. Madison, Wisconsin. More and more coming every day. And they had marched into the Capitol. They had actually occupied the Capitol. So there's 8,000 people in the Capitol day in, day out. Sometimes two, 3,000 sleeping through the night in the Capitol. My kids' daycare provider came up to the Capitol and said, there's so many kids here, we need a daycare center. They seized the hearing room, and they turned it into a round-the-clock, 24-7 daycare center. The next room over, we're a labor radio station center broadcaster. Right? They were showing all away. And so the whole Capitol, and all this stuff coming on, New York Times, we're going to go cover that. And so they got their reporters out. They said, OK, put on your flat jacket. Get that hat, that little gloppy hat with the press card in. And you know, here's your phrase book. So you can talk to them. And here's the topographical map in case there are hills. So they parachuted into the sky. They came to the square. They saw the largest mass uprising of pro-union sentiment in modern American history. Thousands of students and workers and small business owners and farmers gathered around the Capitol, inside the Capitol, so many inside the Capitol, some days, the dead turn the heat off because in a marble building, when you've got 8,000 people at 98 degrees, the capital becomes 98 degrees. <laughs> All this stuff happened in the New York Times Square said, well, it, this is not the story, obviously. And uh, they left town. They headed south of town down to Gainesville, Wisconsin, in search of the elusive private sector worker who doesn't like public sector workers. And they got down there to Janesville, and of course, it's midday, you go, where would you find a worker in a circumstance like this? A, a tavern. And so they walk into the tavern, pop open the phrase book. Hello, worker. You are upset because you've been laid off, and you still have to pay taxes. Well, those awful teachers, they have pay and benefits, they get three months off in the summer. You don't like it that they ride their yachts across the lake to pick up their wildly expensive checks, do you? And the guy at the bar, the guy sitting in the bar goes, yeah, I am upset. I am a worker. I used to be an auto worker at the GM plant that got closed here. I'm a UAW man, and I'm really upset because, you know, I pay taxes, and these public sector workers, these teachers, these plow drivers, these cops, these firefighters, why? They're living large. What do you have to do to be a firefighter? Run into a fire, you know? And, and so the guy just did every cliche, you know, filled every cliche. And of course, you know what, what happens? If you fill every cliche imaginable for the, for the media, they're going to put your story on the front page. And so the front page of the New York Times, there's a letter, is private sector workers do not support public sector workers in Wisconsin. And it was really a bummer headline. I would have been particularly upset if I hadn't read the corrections down by the hemorrhoid ad on page two <laughs> about a week later. And there was this one that said, about that article on Janesville, Wisconsin, it turns out that the guy that we interviewed, well, when we checked the records at the uh, GM plant, uh, he had never worked at the GM plant. He had never worked at any other plant. And in fact, when we finally did check with the United Auto Workers, it turns out he had never been a member of the United Auto Workers Union. In fact, <coughs> come to think of it, and I'm not making this up, the name was wrong. The name he gave us wasn't actually his name. And so basically everything we said was wrong. And I thought to myself, how could they have gotten that right? What did they have done? It was a perplexing moment. And I thought, well, here's a novel idea. They could have stayed in Madison with those tens of thousands of people because every day marching with the public sector workers were hundreds of members of Local 95 United Auto Workers from Janesville, Wisconsin. Wow. 
<laughs> so, you know, it has an impact when our media is so bought into cliches and stereotypes about how union people, working people, couldn't possibly unite any kind of solidarity. It's a big deal. It's a bigger deal when they keep trying to bury our movements, when they keep trying to tell us that we're dead, keep trying to nail that coffin shut. I, I, I hesitate to suggest it, but I do believe there's something of a vampire spirit alive in the, in the protest movements, because every time they try to bury us, we seem to push the, the lid up and come marching back. But in Wisconsin, they tried to bury it so hard and so fast. And the big story in Wisconsin, of course, was that these protests actually made Democrats be Democrats. Yay. It's an unprecedented phenomenon. Spines were growing all across the state of Wisconsin. And the great Democrat be Democrat moment came when the Wisconsin state senators, the 14 members of the state senate who are Democrats, a tiny minority, they were about to be forced to be cogs in the machine. It was their job to sit there while the Republicans passed the bill. Mark Miller, the leading Democrat in the state Senate, he's the, the minority, he's, he's the bill of Wisconsin. <laughs> Mark Miller, on the day they were going to pass the bill, he said, he was looking through the rules, and he said to one of his aides, what's this fiscal quorum thing? And the aide said, well, that's a, to pass a budget bill, they've got to have a certain number of senators here. If they don't do it, if they don't senators aren't in the room, they can't pass the bill, they can't advance it. And Mark Miller said, well, how many senators would have to be missing in order to stop the bill? And the aide said, well, it would be 14. He said, how many Democratic senators do we have? Do we count? 14. Mark said, let's call a meeting. So that all the senators come in. He said, no aides, nobody here. He says, gentlemen, ladies, we haven't always been the best Democrats. Some of us are a little more conservative. Some of us are more a little more liberal. But when we look out the window of the Capitol, there's an awful lot of people out there, about 50,000 of them, and they look a lot like our constituents. And I think that what we ought to do is hightail it out of the Capitol. Now, under state law, if you're in Wisconsin, the state patrol can come and get you and make you go to the Capitol and sit there for the session, so that wouldn't work. So we need to hightail out of the Capitol. We do the ultimate sacrifice for a Wisconsinite. We need to go to Illinois. <laughs> and he said to him, he said, I know you don't have your toothbrushes. I know you, some of you got need medicines and stuff. One of you seven months pregnant. But uh, you can't tell anybody, and the bands are waiting outside. Is everybody in? And amazingly enough, all 14 Democrats walked out of the Capitol, got into the bands, and went to Illinois. Sometimes the best way to represent your constituents is to not sit there and let the other guys tear your state apart. Check in the fabulous La Quinta Inn in the parking lot right there. <laughs> they spent the better part of three weeks there. That's where this movement built up. That's where we started to get hundreds of thousands of people in the streets. This occupation of the capital. The movement spread across Wisconsin. In Juneau, Wisconsin, a crossroads town. 500 people gathered outside their courthouse. In Platteville, Wisconsin, a town of 7,000. 1,500 people came out to their courthouse. In Washburn, Wisconsin, a town of 2,000 up on Lake Superior. 3,000 people showed up to protest when the governor showed up. People from all over northern Wisconsin, they were coming on snowmobiles to protest Scott Walker. This movement was growing everywhere, and Scott Walker and his aides decided, we can't let this happen. This thing is getting out of control. We've got to pass this bill, or even Republicans might start to remember they're the party of Lincoln. They're not supposed to be anti-labor. And so they decided to do an incredible thing. They thought, let's break the bill in half. Let's, let's get rid of the fiscal part of it, then we won't need a fiscal quorum, we won't need the Democrats. Mm -hmm. Now, incredibly enough, I don't understand this part, but you may even help me out with it. Um, they said that a bill involving collective bargaining, wages, pensions, and benefits was not a fiscal bill. <laughs> not, about, but not about money issues. Now, I would have thought it was, but they said it wasn't, and they said we don't follow open meetings laws, we don't follow any of the rules, we're going to pass this bill. And they passed the bill. And the next day, Governor signed it. And the New York Times headline said, Wisconsin fight is over. Oh. <laughs> Unions have been defeated. Because, of course, we live in America, right? And when the elected despot, when the king for four years does what he wants to do, it's over. There's no more story. Walk away. Don't, you know, just, and the only thing missing from the headline was, peasants, back to your hovels. <laughs>
And I was very bummed out when I saw that headline. I thought to myself, well, I really thought that there was sort of a people power movement here. I thought it was a little like Egypt, a little like uh, all these things going on around the world, all these people coming square. Now I find out we've been defeated. It's over. Next day, a bunch of my farmer friends were coming in from around Wisconsin. Uh, you know that the New York Times doesn't get delivered until three days late on the farm. And so they were unaware that the struggle was over. And I got down south of town, I took my daughter Whitman along with me, and all these tractors had gathered up dozens of tractors from all over Wisconsin. If I was a brave man, if I was a courageous man, I would have said to the farmers, look, brothers, you know, sisters, the struggle is over. We've been defeated. Head back. Go back. Do your chores. But I just didn't have the guts to do it, because one of the guys had gotten up at midnight in Cobb, Wisconsin, where my grandpa's from. He had done chores on his dairy farm from midnight to 3 a.m., and he had ridden seven, seven hours into Madison on an open tractor. Now, how do you tell that guy he just wasted his time, right? So I said, okay, well, you know, let's hop on the tractor. It's fun to head in. And so got on the tractor. Whitman got on the tractor. My friend Joel Greeno from up in northwest Wisconsin says, let's roll. So we started rolling out. Now, I'm not sure how many Arizonans are aware of this, but tractors do not move fast. <laughs> it took us 15 minutes to get to the first corner. <laughs> we got to that corner. I saw the, tra the pathos, the tragedy of our circumstance. There were three little children. They had made a handmade sign that said, thank you, farmers. And I thought to myself, oh, man, not only didn't the New York Times arrive on the farm, they, someone forgot to tell the kids. And we rounded that corner and we started heading up to the next corner. There's another 15 minutes. There was about 100 people out there. They had a handmade sign, big banner. It said, farmers and workers pulled together solidarity. And I thought to myself, I've been waiting a long time to see this. Amen. This is a beautiful sight. And yet, we've been defeated. Struggle's over. We kept heading up the road a little bit more. And suddenly, the police cars arrived with their lights flashing. I thought, oh, no, I'm going to be in so much trouble with my wife. <laughs> I took my kid out on a Saturday morning and we got arrested at a farmer demonstration. <laughs> but then I forgot we were in Madison, Wisconsin, where the police and the sheriff's deputies were standing in solidarity with the workers and they had come to block the streets so the farmers and the farmers could head out to the Then the SUVs showed up. You know SUVs don't like tractors? If I got down that country road, there's tractor printing, it's not a pleasant picture. As the SUV showed up, I, thought, I saw the windows rolling down, I said to my daughter, shield your eyes, Whitman. You're about to see the one-fingered signal of disapproval of your political position. But instead of the one finger, I saw a hand come out of that SUV and formed into the clenched fist of solidarity, which looks a little bit like the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> and car after car came driving by, SUV after SUV, with the clenched fist rolled out of the window, and then Wisconsinites are not the smartest people in the world. We live in a place where it can get to be 80 below zero wind chill. And then we go out and we drill a hole and we fish through ice. <laughs> but after three weeks, we had learned how to honk the slogan, this is what democracy looks like on our horns. Beep, 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 beep. And those SUVs were beeping along as we went along with their fists outside the window. Beep, 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 beep. And the police lights were flashing and the farmers were waving. And I thought to myself, this is the saddest day of my life. <laughs> because all this stuff has happened and all these things I've been waiting so long to see and we've been defeated. The newspaper record in America tells us the struggle is over because the governor signed a bill that nothing else can happen, that the movements must end when power gets a little bit of what it wants. And I was feeling a little down. I was thinking, what could make me feel happier? I'm listening. It's a fading sound. Beep, 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 beep. The fists in the air, the police lights. And then we popped over that curve into the great square in Madison, and we were greeted by 180,000 people who do not read the New York Times. <laughs>